Hey, good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday morning, April the 28th, the blessed year of our Lord, 2020. The year of great vision. God's showing us things, isn't he? It's good to get started with you this morning uh, from the book of Psalm. The Psalms, Psalm 20, verses, uh, verse uh, 7. It says, Some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. And, of course, nations isn't talking about countries. It's talking about people. Some people boast on what they have and their, their own strength. David says, we boast in the name of the Lord our God, which supersedes all that other stuff. And that's how we should approach every day, that we are belong to the Most High God and that he's on our side. It's going to be a good day. We're uh, diving into our series of uh, living blessed in a COVID-19 world and where it seems like the whole world has been turned topsy-turvy and we're having to uh, decide how we're going to live, what kind of attitude we're going to have. Yesterday we talked about attitude and how important it is. Today we're actually going to begin uh, going through the text of the Beatitudes. Uh, what kind of attitude are we going to walk with? What's important? What did Jesus say was important for us to have as our attitudes and our actions, the deep down things that we value? And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. And, and actually, Matthew 5 is where we'll be for the next uh, two weeks. So um, that'll become a, pa a familiar passage of Scripture. Today, we, uh, we're going to look at verse number 3. And it's the first of the Beatitudes. And it just simply says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, many interpretations and teachings have uh, been set out uh, for the, you know, 2,000 years uh, through the principles conveyed in the Beatitudes. Each one of these uh, Beatitudes is a proverb-like saying uh, that's packed with meaning and worthy of study. And so we're, we're going to take a few minutes each day this week and next to think about what Jesus was revealing to his disciples, to us. And most uh, scholars agree that the Beatitudes give us a beautiful picture of what the true disciple of God looks like. You know, there's a, there's a big difference between someone who calls himself a Christian and someone who is a true disciple. Anybody can call themselves a Christian if they like Jesus. But a true follower of Jesus, a true disciple of Jesus, has to have a, a life change, a heart change. It's that discipline of choosing to obey and follow the Lord. And that's that's different. And I think maybe we'll catch a catch a glimpse of that today. Let's start out with a definition uh, because it's used over and over. Every one of these uh, Beatitudes starts with the same word and that's the word blessed. Now I, I learned it, the old King James, and so we learned it how we, we, we said that word blessed, blessed. You know, it just sounded more poetic, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, but it's blessed. You can say blessed. You can say blessed. It's either way. Uh, but the word blessed or blessed uh, means to be made holy, consecrated, set apart, extremely happy, self-contained happiness, independent of our circumstances, endowed with divine favor, and content. Wow, what a variety of words, right? And it's interesting that being made holy and consecrated, being set apart, we know those are those are holy words. Those are sanctified words. Those are words about, about being uh, super, you know, godlike. And then the same word has the understanding, the meaning of, of uh, extreme happiness, 
a self-contained happiness. That means you're independent of outside circumstances. Your happiness doesn't depend on other things. It's something that's on the inside of you and, uh, and, and endowed with divine favor and content. Wow. I, what a, what a wealth of uh, description for the word blessed. So with that in our minds, right, Jesus tells us blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, all those adjectives that we just, and definitions that we just uh, read, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now that seems to be a justification of two stands, right? Blessed and poor, but it doesn't say poor, it says poor in spirit. So what does that mean? So this statement is really full of meaning and and yet it's subject to misunderstanding. We have to uh, have, uh, not only do we have to redefine our notions of the word blessed, but we have to understand the puzzling phrase poor in spirit. So what does poor in spirit mean? Poor in spirit means you recognize your poverty before God, your need before God. Now, it's not a, mon a monetary thing. It's not about it's not about what you don't have in your pocketbook. It doesn't it's not about that at all. Poor in spirit is not the same as poor. You can have absolutely nothing material uh, in your world and yet be uh, not poor in spirit. You can be <laughs> rich in spirit. Uh, but you work through this process, okay? So it's an attitude, poor in spirit is an attitude toward yourself that says you know and you agree, you affirm that you haven't lived the life to which God has called you and that you're incapable of doing so now without his intervention. To be poor in spirit is the first mark of a person who truly walks with God. Becoming poor in spirit goes against our current culture. We have a very self-affirming culture. It's a culture of affirmation. And, and it's sometimes it seems like parents and teachers and counselors and politicians and advertisers, they all conspire to tell us just how great we are. And you know, apart from a miracle of uh, God's grace, we believe them. We believe them. That's a dramatic contrast to the wisdom that calls us to trust God. And I want to say this in the right way, to doubt ourselves. Now, I'll have to explain it maybe a little bit. But let's go to Proverbs 3, 5, because you know this passage of Scripture, perhaps. And maybe that helps us. It's Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. See, uh, uh, I think that we, we come to this place where we are taught, you know, how magnificent we are, how great we are. And, uh, you know, everybody gets a trophy, <laughs> you know, a red. I mean, affirmation is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I think affirmation and pumping people up is great. But there is a place where you, you cross a line to, uh, from affirmation into um, just believing that you don't need anybody outside of yourself to sustain life or to be successful in life. And uh, it's ironic that people who are the farthest from God will feel like they have the ability to face whatever challenge comes their way. I can do this. I'm up for it. I can handle it. And in some ways, you, you need to be able to have that self-talk that I can do this. Um, but for the life of a believer, there has to be an added element. Maybe it's uh, not always spoken, but there has to be the added element of I can do this because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm up for it because God is walking with me. I can handle this because he, he's with me. He doesn't leave me. He doesn't forsake me. For someone who walks with God, we we say something different. 
David said it this way in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. In other words, I'm going to go through these things, but I know that Jesus, that God is right here with me. We know the Holy Spirit's right here with us. And that makes all the difference in the world between these two positions. In one case, you, you very precariously stand far away from God and you declare your independence. Yoo-hoo, I can do this. I've trained for this. On the other hand, you confidently stand close, confidently stand close to the Lord, and you rely on Him, on His, on Him for His, for His strength to flow through your life. Here's what we know: people who are truly poor in spirit don't flaunt their gifts. People who are poor in spirit don't blame their sins and failings on other people. People who are poor in spirit are unimpressed with their own attempts to live a godly life. We know, those of us who are learning what it means to be poor in spirit, we know that it takes the, the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives for us to be able to navigate these days. In a world where personalities are huge, um, and God is often regarded as a side prop on the stage of our own performance. People who are poor in spirit know that they're just, we're just a small blip on the radar screen of eternity. I love the, the language of David. He says, we're just like a, a, we're just like a, a withering grass, a fading flower. In the words of a Kansas song, we're dust in the wind. Uh, we know, those of us who are learning what it means to be poor in spirit, we know that God is glorious and awesome in his holiness. And we know that he doesn't owe us anything. Even if viewed at our best, we're unworthy servants who depend on his mercy, except that God embraces us and he brings us in as sons and daughters with a full inheritance, <laughs> joint heirs with Jesus. But that's not of our doing. That's not of our doing at all. It's his grace. Those who are poor in spirit understand what it means to live daily in the grace and mercy of God. Meditating on God's awesomeness greatly affects our ability to be poor in spirit. But this beatitude, Matthew 5, 3, offers something else that should humble us even more. And that's the promise of heaven. Blessed are, are the poor in spirit. What is it that they receive? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, interestingly... That's a promise for the present. I know when we think of heaven, we think future, but can we read, read this one more time? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, take a look at some of the other ones. Look at verse uh, four through six. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall, can you see that? For they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, verse 3 breaks that pattern. It's different. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is. Now, is there a difference between is and shall? Yeah. Jesus is talking about a taste of heaven that you can enjoy right now. It's yours. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're a part of it now. It's a part of you now. Being poor in spirit is more than just a spiritual discipline. It's more than just a Christian character trait. It's part of becoming like Jesus, who humbled himself to become a servant of God's redemptive purpose on earth. Jesus said some remarkably humble statements. This is Jesus. I'm just going to give you three. 
In John 5.30, it says, I can do nothing on my own. John 6.38, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 8.50, I do not seek my own glory. Now, Jesus says this, says those words about himself. He exhibited spiritual poverty in a serious, open way. These are the words of the Son of God. He says, I can do nothing on my own. I'm not seeking my own glory. I'm not, I'm, not even, I'm not here to do my own will. I'm here to do the will of the Father. Those are the words of the Son of God. How much more should they be our words? The blessedness of Jesus is seen in his gentle and lowly heart. In pursuing humility, you and I reflect the beauty of his life. And really, that's what poor in spirit means means a humility, a humbleness that we have before God. As we wrap this up this morning, I, I want to uh, just read the words of the Apostle Paul, who wrote a beautiful series of verses uh, describing Jesus' uh, spiritual poverty and, and the act, the unfathomable, un, unimaginable act of the God lowering himself to become one of us. It's one of my favorite passages of, of scripture in the book of Philippians chapter two, verses six through 11. This is what it says. Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born to the in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself. Jesus knew that the way up is to go down. I'm wondering today what the Lord wants to bring us to. Well, we know he wants to mold us and shape us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. We know that. The word tells us that. But the Lord also has a task for us, not only the being, but the doing. And therefore, if we're going to do, we need to be. Part of our being is understanding that the, hum the human uh, emptying of ourselves needs to take place. Jesus understood that. We're to understand that. We're his disciples. So this being poor in spirit is actually a part of the process of releasing the very glory of heaven on this earth. If you and I want to be truly blessed, if we want to be made holy, consecrated, set apart, extremely happy, self-contained happiness, independent of our circumstances, endowed with divine favor and content, we must get over ourselves. We must submit ourselves. We must die to ourselves and humble ourselves so that God will be glorified in and through our lives just like Jesus. Because after all, we are blessed to bless. We are blessed to bless. Jesus understood that the emptying of himself would be some of the greatest blessing that enabled the greatest blessing ever to be upon this earth. And you and I, if we're going to be a blessing to this world, we have to first find our place of blessing within ourselves. And the first step, according to Jesus, he didn't make a mistake, he prioritized. The first step is humble yourself. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that in due season and due time, he will lift you up. Right now, God wants to do that in us. 
But we have to be the ones to say, God, I can't do this without you. We have to be the ones that empty ourselves of ourselves so that God can fill us with himself. Lord, I thank you that today we have an opportunity to consciously empty ourselves of ourselves. All that ego stuff, all of the things of well, how talented we are, how great we are, believing all of our accolades. Lord, we set them all, we give them all back to you. We set them aside, we give them back to you. Yes, Lord, you have talent, given us talents. You've given us abilities. You've given us skills. And Lord, you did that. We didn't do that ourselves. It doesn't come naturally. It is a gift from you. So, Lord, we give all those things back to you, whatever they may be. And, Lord, we just take every part of us and we humble ourselves before you. Lord, that you would be magnified in us. May we follow the example of Jesus who emptied himself so that the whole earth could be filled. Lord, we empty ourselves. We empty ourselves so that we can be poor in spirit and the kingdom comes alive in us. Not a future tense kingdom, a right now kingdom. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done right here in this earth, just as it is in heaven. Lord, thank you for letting us be blessed and making us blessed so that we can be a blessing. I speak blessing over each one who's watching and listening today. Lord, that we will be a blessing to others as we journey through this day. Full of hope, full of faith, full of love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you this morning. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 8. And also, uh, don't forget we have Bible study uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday night at 7. And right here where you're watching right now. And we will be finishing up our little three-part series uh, from 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. These things that abide, faith, hope, and love. And we'll be looking at love. And you say, well, Pastor Bob, I don't need to tune in because I know everything there is to ever know about love. Yeah. You probably should tune in. All right. I'll see you later. God bless. Have a great day. Bye-bye.